Amplification is a huge part of electronics, audio amplification in particular. This is a topic I was going to cover a good bit into the future, but some of my upcoming videos are to deal with speakers and microphones and such, and when I tried to use my oscilloscope's function generator, increased by a transistor to drive a speaker just to test it out real quick, I discovered it's not as easy as it seems. So I ended up having to look up amplifiers and found one. It's not a great one, it has big issues, but it works. It's great for testing, and we'll do all kinds of amplifiers in the future. There's dozens of videos to be made on the topic. But without further ado, let's go over the simplest, easiest, quickest, you might even say roughest, amplifier there is. It's called Class A. I will cover inductors, electromagnets, electromagnetism, speakers, and audio processing in future videos. Right now, the super quick overview is, if you have a coil of wire and a magnet, you can create a current in the wire that moves the magnet. A speaker is a diaphragm that pushes air back and forth to create sound. The way it works is you have a voltage. At zero voltage, the magnet attached to the diaphragm is in the middle. If you apply voltage in one direction, the diaphragm moves that way. Voltage in the other direction, it moves the other way. So by varying the voltage, you move the diaphragm. And that's what an audio signal is. So like I said, the point of amplification is when you have a source that doesn't have a lot of power because a diaphragm is a physical thing pushing air. And the louder you want to make the signal, the more air you need to push. Your computer speaker port is not going to be able to put out enough power to operate a big old subwoofer or even a regular speaker. That's why your speakers plug in. The computer provides the signal, the plug provides the power. Or you can have battery powered speakers. The same thing with my function generator. The function generator can put out some current, probably enough to basically hear if I put my ear up to it, but I don't really want to run my extremely expensive oscilloscope near its limits, especially since it doesn't even specify those limits. Presumably, it can't overrun its own limits. Presumably. Let's not test that. So anyway, the first thing we do is we have a load. This is our speaker. Here's a surprising fact about speakers. They are an inductive load, so there's trickiness there, but in terms of impedance, resistance, common speakers, anywhere from four to eight. Four to eight what? Kilo ohms? Mega ohms? No, ohms. An eight ohm load. That's not much considering a good quality wire might be one. So that was surprising fact number one. But in any case, we have established that we're going to have to drive this load with something better than the signal generator in terms of power. This could be the output port on your computer for your speakers. This could be the headphone jack on your phone. This could be my function generator. This could be any number of things, but this is for the signal. So here is our power supply. So let's not worry about that for a moment. Let's just power this load. Now, there are many things not really wrong with this circuit, but dangerous about this circuit. First of all, we're using a BJT and it relies upon the property of BJT to limit current. We have very little resistance, so it's wasteful of power and if you're not careful, you can just blow your BJT to pieces. The second thing is, this runs a current through your speakers all the time. It's biased. It has a DC bias so that there's always a current and it's up and down from that current. So this, if you run it as a normal speaker all the time, it's going to eventually destroy your speakers. It's going to wear them out. It's perfectly fine for a test. It's not going to hurt it. It's not going to hurt it at all used in short measures. But if you just use it as a normal amplifier for all your sessions, it will eventually destroy your speakers. But in short bursts, absolutely fine. It's not going to overload the speaker. It's not going to exceed its specifications. It's just going to constantly drive it. So we have a power supply and we have our speaker. We also have, unsurprisingly, a transistor. The base to emitter junction is going to be controlled by the signal to throttle and unthrottle the current going through the load. So the positive power is connected directly to the load. There is a junction here at the collector, the input of the NPN. The speakers plug into it. So it's essentially a variable low side switch. And we do have our shared ground, of course, because this is a signaling application. The the amount of this signal is proportional to the amount of this signal, so the grounds need to be the same, the reference voltages need to be the same, so that the amplification operates correctly. So we just tie the grounds together. And of course the transistor 
goes into it. So before I continue, let's look at what we have here. Again, it's just a basically a variable low side switch. So we have a circuit like this, and the current is going to go through like this. And it always will. We are not going to be reversing the flow through the transistor. You can sort of, don't worry about it. But it's always going to be like this. Now you say a signal, an audio signal, is positive and negative voltage, which means positive and negative current. But remember, it's biased. So you have your audio signal, and normally the audio signal might be like this. But the amplified audio signal will be like this. So it's going to have its zero there. So this is what I mean by it's always driving the speaker. So if this is the midpoint where you're applying zero volts to the speaker, to the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is at rest, and then let's say positive voltage goes this way, negative voltage goes this way, so it's going like this. But if you have a bias, then that bias might put it over here, and then it's going like this. So you've got your audio signal, but it's actually over here. So it's going further to the right and less to the right, but always to the right. You see what I mean? This is why it's wasteful, because first of all, you're not using the full range. Although you could certainly design a speaker that only goes this way, but let's not get sidetracked here. So that's the bias. It's always keeping the diaphragm on one side, and it's moving it back and forth. Now this will produce the correct sound because you've got the diaphragm moving roughly the same distance. It's not exactly linear, so it's not going to be exactly right, but it's basically going to give you the signal you want to a rough human ear. So that's the bias. So we are always operating our current through the correct direction. Now, here is the actual thing that creates the bias. We have a resistor. This resistor connects between the collector and the base, but it's not really connecting the collector and base logically. It, it physically is, but that's not the point. That's not really anything to do with it. What it's doing is connecting the base to this positive power supply. So right now, this base to emitter junction is permanently forward biased. There's the bias. So this thing is always on. Now, if you Google a class A amplifier, you're going to get a slightly modified circuit. It's going to have two resistors instead of one over here that form a voltage divider, and then there will be another resistor down here at the emitter. That's a safer way to do it, but I'm not going to cover it because a class A amplifier just isn't good anyway. There's no reason to really use them. This is more to understand. Amplifiers are a crazy topic. Like this is days and days and days and days and days and days of learning. Amplifiers are complex. So we start here and then we move up and up and up and up piece at a time. So it's great to learn, but we're not gonna use a class A amplifier, except I am using this one for a test circuit. So this works perfectly fine, it's simple. This is for, you wanna test a speaker. You want an amplifier real quick, just right now, quick and dirty. This is your go-to for the simplest possible audio amplifier that uses one, resistor, one transistor, it's really simple. But this is how we establish the bias in the simple circuit. So we've got the main pathway of current through the speakers, always in the same direction. And then the bias makes sure that it stays on and biases it to a certain minimum level, to a certain base level. Now we have only one more component, one capacitor. Okay, so there's three pieces. And surprisingly, we're done. Two things you might notice about this. The first, that is a polarized capacitor. Obviously, an unpolarized would be better because this is an AC signal. It goes up and down. You're not supposed to run those backwards. That's true. That's another reason this circuit is a little goofy. If you do it the more safe way that you find from Googling, you can use smaller ceramic capacitors. It works just fine. But again, actually making a class A amplifier is silly. We understand it and then we move on. This is the quick and dirty one. The second thing you might notice is that we have an AC signal going into the base of the transistor, but the transistor doesn't operate on AC. So we've got negative voltage going into the base. The capacitor doesn't do anything. It blocks DC, not AC. Well, it's the bias. So we're not actually getting negative. I'll explain that in a moment. First, a quick word about the electrolytic. The reason for that is ceramics don't come that big. You can probably get a capacitor in the 100 microfarad range. I suppose that would help. This one is 100 microfarad. Let's try that with better handwriting. There we are. That is a 100 microfarad capacitor. You could use 10 microfarad capacitors together, but then you'd need 10 of them. So, that's all right. So the way 
Real quick, the way an electrolytic capacitor works is you have an oxide layer on a foil. That oxide layer is your insulator between the two conductors. If you run an electrolytic capacitor in reverse, it destroys the oxide layer, it dissolves it into the electrolyte. And then you have a wire, and that's called a short circuit and heat, and that's why they cut little things on the top of them so the magic liquid smoke goes <laughs> instead of <laughs> But here's the thing. It takes time. It's obviously quick in terms of human time scales, but if you have a signal that's constantly changing, you're going to have some on positive end and some on negative end, it's going to do a little damage and heal it. The oxide will reform and damage and heal and damage and heal and damage and heal. Also, if you're using low enough voltage, this can survive a limited amount of reverse voltage. Not too much. 0.5 volts maximum recommended, 1.5 maximum probably before it starts exploding. But the point is, in a situation like this, where you've got a varying, rapidly varying signal of low voltage, less than a volt, in fact, for mine, it's all right. It's still not good. You shouldn't do it, but it's okay. If you can find a ceramic capacitor in 100 microfarad, you feel free. And then over here, this resistor is 2 Two O O ohms, 2.2K ohms, and this speaker, the one I have, and a fairly common value for regular speakers, not specialized ones, is 8 ohms. So those are your values. So how does this actually work? So let's say this signal is zero, and it has been zero for quite some time. It's just chilling. This capacitor on this end is charged to zero. On this end, you can carry it through and see that it's connected to the positive with the resistance, so we have an RC network. So this end has charged to the positive of the power, and this end has charged to the zero of the signal. And you'll notice it's backwards, so you don't want to sit there on silence too long. Or you could flip it. If you think there's a lot of silence, you can hook it up that way might actually be smarter but if it's small volt differences it won't matter but we'll go ahead and do that just for fun so this end is charged to zero this end is charged to whatever this positive is and this has been conducting at its base right it's it's just the positive here so it's conducting whatever current it's limited to by this resistor this resistor controls the base to emitter junction current which controls the collector to emitter current and also it's passing through the 8 ohm load which is not a lot but it's not nothing so this is permanently keeping the speaker diaphragm on one side so now we've got zero here and power voltage here let's say the signal goes up so now we have a higher voltage here so you have a higher voltage at this spot than this so this capacitor wants to charge this end up to this voltage that it's supplying. So current is going to go this way, not literally through the capacitor, but effectively through, because electrons will bunch up, or actually bunch up this way and go out this way, you know what I mean. So effective current will go through the capacitor, through the base to emitter junction and back around while the capacitor is charging. So what you have is the normal current going through base to emitter, the bias, and then this adds to it. This is going in the same direction. So you increase the base to emitter current, which means you increase the collector to emitter current going this way. So more current is going through here, which means it has a higher voltage drop across it, V equals IR, roughly. So now, from the bias, you have a higher value, so the diaphragm moves further away from the center point. Now, let's do the opposite. Let's say the signal goes lower. So instead of being the same, this end is now higher than this end. So the capacitor wants to discharge through this. So the current goes through here, backwards to the base to emitter junction, and back around. But we're not reverse biasing the base to emitter junction. We have the bias current. So what happens is you have a strong current this way, strong in relative sense. You have a greater current going through and a lesser current opposing it. It's like 5 minus 1 equals 4, or 5 plus negative 1 equals 4. So this current going backwards from this current reduces the flow. Doesn't bring it to zero, doesn't bring it to negative, it just reduces the flow. So there's less current going through the collector to emitter junction, less current going through the speaker, which means V equals IR roughly, less voltage across, which means the diaphragm moves a little closer to the zero. Never actually the zero, but closer. And that is how it works. You have a constantly biased signal, and this charging and discharging based on the signal causes a with or against flow 
that modifies the bias current to change the voltage on the load. Pretty tricky. So let's actually see it in action. So I have here my oscilloscope. I'm not going to be measuring anything with it. I'm going to be using only the waveform generator. So it's going to be a sine wave, offset zero. That means no DC bias. And right now I have it set on two millivolts peak to peak, so plus one and minus one above and below. In previous videos, I have said that peak to peak is from zero to the top. I was incorrect. If you have a positive peak of one and a negative peak of negative one, that's two peak to peak. So hopefully nobody notices that little mistake. But in any case, ignore the display. All that matters is this, which you probably can't read anyway. So zero offset, zero bias, and minimal amplitude just for safety. I'm turning it down before I turn it up because I've got to make the circuit. And then frequency, the human hearing range is like t two to 20 kilohertz, something like that. So we'll be messing around in that range. The speaker I'm using is one that I ripped out of the circuit breaker box, the spooky breaker box. On the back of it, it says eight ohms and 0.5 watts. So you never want to put more than 0.5 watts through it. It's a dinky little thing. It's plastic. You can push it a little bit. But in any case, it is a standard eight ohm speaker. And then I have my power supply set to zero volt, zero amps. I have a 100 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. I have a 2200 ohm, 2.2 K ohm resistor, and I have an NPN BJT transistor. All of this together is still less than a dollar in parts, so this is pretty good circuit. So I'm going to first connect my signal generator's output to one side of the capacitor. The output of the capacitor is going to connect to the base of the transistor. I'm also going to connect the base to one side of the resistor. The other side of the resistor is going to connect to the collector. And of course, the collector will also connect to the negative end of the speaker. The positive end of the speaker is connected to the power from my bench power supply. I'm going to join the grounds of the bench power supply and the signal generator. And then to the joined ground, I'm going to connect the emitter of the transistor. And that's it. Both ends of the capacitor, both ends of the resistor, both ends of the speaker are all connected. So now, without turning on the signal, I'm going to turn on the power to one volt. And I'm going to turn the current limit Let's just turn it up to 50 milliamps. So you can see without any signal at all, we have a current draw of about 19 milliamps. So it's letting 19 milliamps through the transistor. So that right there is your throwaway current. No matter what, you're throwing away about that. The only time you're going to draw less is when the signal is negative on one side, which is going to be balanced by when it's positive on one side. So basically, it's constantly wasting that. And that's only one volt. The sources I see for the circuit recommend three to five, and they're using a power transistor. The thing's rated for like 10 amps. This is just a regular the transistor so one volt will be plenty thank you very much but like I said that's not going to vary too much because negatives and positives will roughly cancel so let me go ahead and increase the amplitude of my input signal can you hear it I mean not short this out you should hopefully be able to hear that that is at 50 millivolts peak to peak and it is currently at 3.2 kilohertz let me turn it up to 100 millivolts peak to peak pretty decent volume I'm going to be sad if I'm editing this and you don't hear this, but let me now change the frequency. And it's as simple as that. There's nothing more to it. But while we're here, let me turn the volume back up. Just for fun, let's change this to a square wave. Can you hear the difference? Same volume. Let me change the frequency. Does it sound a little retro? That's a square wave. How about a ramp wave? Essentially a triangle, I think, in this configuration. Different sounds. In any case, that's plenty. Turn off the wave gen, turn down the power of the amplifier, turn everything off. So as you can see, 19 milliamps running just this little thing with only one volt input. This is a terrible circuit to actually use for anything production. But it's great for just testing this out, isn't it? Now we know the speaker works. And you might say, well, why wouldn't you just plug the speakers in? Well, that's if you're testing a discrete component. If you buy a pair of speakers and want to test it, yes, you just plug it in. But if you have a speaker as a discrete component, if it comes to you and it doesn't even have wires soldered onto it yet, set up your function generator in your quick little circuit, grab your two signal wires and touch them to the leads, and now you've tested your speaker. It's useful. So that was step one of many 
of amplifiers. I think it would bog down the channel too much to do all of one thing at a time, so we'll keep weaving in and out. Sort of project-based. I think of a project I want to do, and then I do all the pieces connected to that project. So now we're going to do some stuff with speakers, and that thing I want to do with speakers is going to connect back into my DC to AC converter, as well as my foot pedal switch, which I haven't forgotten about. But until then, I'll be seeing you.